<clears throat> and of all the things I get to do on campus, one of the things I really enjoy doing is talking to people about sleep. And <clears throat> I'm going to make a little caveat. Uh, people think I'm a sleep expert because that's what you all like to hear me talk about. You don't really want me to talk about uh, road, small rodents and big sheep and things like that that I really study. Uh, but I study circadian rhythms. And uh, sleep is a biological rhythm. And as I'll tell you shortly, um, it's an important part of how you regulate your sleep. And, and if you have trouble with sleep, one of the things you need to do is to think about the regularity, the timing at which you do things. So I always start, I like to start off when I'm going to talk about, there's, there's room up here. Uh, I'm dragging today. Did you ever have one of those days where you can't seem to wake up and Luann is going through light, right? I've had a decade like that. So for those of you who are students in this room, this is probably not an unusual, certainly days and weeks like this. At the end of the semester, a lot of people are feeling like this. And why is that? And it's really because we don't get enough sleep. Um, our society is not very good at that. So I'm going to start uh, by look, having you think about your sleep pattern. I'm going to talk a little bit about why sleep is important, what happens if you don't get enough. Uh, there's a lot of data that's been growing over the last 20 years, but certainly over the last decade, it's very, very clear that poor sleep brings on a host of physiological and cognitive problems. Um, what exactly is it? I'm going to give you a teeny little primer on that uh, because I want to stay within our time frame talk a little bit about how it changes across the lifespan. We have a wide range here, so that's a nice, nice. And then uh, why is this titled uh, the talk Permission to Sleep? I'm going to give you permission to sleep and tell you some hints and key clues about how you might improve your sleep if you have problems. So I like to start with this survey. If you'll read these questions and keep a track on your hand of how many you say true to. All right. Can everybody see it? They're counting up how many times you say yes to these questions. Are we there? All right. How many have five or more? You are too sleep deprived to drive a car. I'm serious. If you went to the sleep clinic and they did a sleep assessment on you right now, they would tell you that a taxi or a friend needed to drive you home. Five or more means that if you, get, if you get into a situation, like my talk is too boring, you will fall asleep, <laughs> right? Um, this, is, this is why that happens. Children under the age of 10 almost never say yes to these questions in the middle of the day. They don't have this problem. And that has something to do with how our expectations around sleep uh, change culturally as we go through our lives. So while well, I've got in mind the fact that many of you are right now at the end of the semester sleep deprived, not, not shocking, um, how many hours per night on average do you sleep? So think about that for a minute and keep that in mind because I'm going to show you some data about what people do on average versus what they need. Do you go to bed at a regular time and do you get up at a regular time? This is where my circadian pitch is going to come in. So think about your pattern across the week. Do you, most people have a pretty regular schedule of getting up during the week unless they're students and have different different start times for classes during the week. But most people who have jobs have, a, have to be someplace at the same time. But going to bed at the same time tends to be where people fall down pretty badly. And then on the weekends, people frequently sleep a different schedule than they do during the week. OK, so think about that for yourself. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Do we need to sleep? <laughs> yes, you do need to sleep. Uh, but that isn't commonly held opinion. Many people talk about sleep as if it's a, uh, an inconvenience that you'd rather not do. And <clears throat> I will just tell you to start off with, I'm just going to state it as a fact. We have to eat. We have to drink. We have to maintain our appropriate body temperature. We're homeotherms, right? So it's a little easier for us than it is for amphibians and reptiles, but you still got to keep yourself cool enough and, and keep yourself warm enough. You also have to sleep. If you don't do any of these things, eating, drinking, maintaining your body temperature over an extended period, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, you will die. If you do not sleep at all, zero, over a period of a few weeks, you will die. 
And we know that's true for animal models. We know it's true for humans. There are humans with something called sleep familial sleep disorder, which comes on in their, uh, usually in their middle ages, and prevents them from sleeping at all, and they die. So sleep is something that must happen. Okay? So the real question isn't, do we need to sleep? The question is, how much do we need to sleep, and when should we be doing it? And, and it isn't the same across our whole lifespan. All right, so what are some of the functions of sleep? Well, one of those functions is restoration and repair. So that when you get a lot of exercise, your muscles are sore, uh, you need to sleep because during the sleep is when the body takes care of repairing those things. It's also really important for the brain's recovery from a day of work and effort. We now know that the brain literally opens up and the spinal fluid flushes, literally call it flushing, flushes out the biochemical debris of the day and you feel sleepy because of a buildup of chemicals in your brain because of using it, um, and you need to flush that out. So sleep is a period of time with both hormones released that help repair your body, growth hormone, prolactin, and the brain um, clears itself for another day of work. And I'm gonna show you, tell you about some data, I'm not gonna show it to you, but tell you about some data that shows the serious physiological consequences of not getting that done. We also adjust our metabolic needs by sleeping. Sort of at the level of evolutionary discussions, why do animals sleep more or less than we do? Humans are a little unusual in sleeping an eight hour stretch. Many animals sleep slow, smaller bouts through the day. Um, if you own a cat, you know that they'll spend 50% or more of their life asleep. Um, even you know, humans by the time they're a year old aren't doing that. Um, and then there are animals, that, ungulates for example, that sleep less than four or five hours a day and they spend their time eating. But every organism that sleeps, and some simple organisms which go through rest activity cycles, what happens when you're at rest is your metabolism is lowered. So your body temperature goes down, you're not burning fuel. So one of the ideas about why we have evolved sleep in all multicellular organisms or something like sleep is to save energy. It means you have to find less food. You have to be exposed to less danger. Okay, so that's one of the reasons we need to sleep. And the other reason we probably evolve sleep is that we can avoid bad things in the environment. So humans like to hole up. We now build our own caves, uh, but we used to go in caves. Lots of animals go underground. They get up in trees. They try to avoid predators. So not only do they lower their need for energy, but they get out of harm's way. And that may have been the primary reason for going into rest cycles uh, for organisms like us, uh, vertebrates and, and animals, but for plants, the real issue is the sun is only out so many hours of the day. And all of their, they build up um, stores of materials <clears throat> that allow them to function during the dark, but they use them up because the sun isn't there. So we live on a, on a, on a round ball that turns around the sun and that drives uh, much of what we do, including the timing. So what happens if you don't get enough sleep? Well, you all know that at a fundamental level, you, get, you feel sleepy and you get fatigued. Okay, so what are the consequences of being, if you had a short night last night, if, you're, if you're, you only slept four or five hours of sleep, before the day is over, you're going to feel more fatigued than you would if you'd had more sleep. You already know that, right? So what are the, some of the consequences of that fatigue? Uh, first of all, there's a decrease in your reaction time and judgment and vision. So I like to tell my students, if you're driving your car and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the deer races out in front of you, you're likely to pretty quickly see it, recognize a danger, slam on the brakes. Although my husband did that the other day and the deer ran into him anyway. So he didn't hit the deer, but the deer hit him. So these things happen, right? But at three in the morning, when you've already been up for maybe 20 hours, the deer runs out in front of you and the first thing is, do I recognize that it's a deer? And have, how many of you been in the car at, at, at night? And it's not just because it's dark. You're, you're like trying to decide what I'm seeing. Is it real, right? And then you decide it really is a deer. And the rate at which you pick your foot up and move it is slower. Your reaction time is slower, right? And your judgment about what to do may even be wrong. Instead of braking, maybe you'll try to swerve. And in Tennessee, I've learned swerving and going off the road is not a good idea. It works better in Michigan where I come from. It's flat. Um, so impaired vision, reaction time, and judgment about what you should do all happen when you're fatigued, and as a result, accidents are more common. 
Uh, problems with information processing and short-term memory. Students, this is really important when you're preparing for your exams. I will say, and I tell all my freshmen when I teach freshmen, it's better to come into an exam less prepared having for studying hours and have had a good night's sleep. Because without that good night's sleep, your judgment of what you're, the, how well you read the question, whether you understand what it's referring to, is damaged. And so you're more likely to do well on, better on the exam um, if you've had a good night's sleep, in part because things that you have learned have been stored, gone from short-term memory into longer-term memory, but more importantly, information processing, the ability to process the difficult, you know, a complex question and write a good response. Um, decreased performance, vigilance, and motivation. So here, let's think about our basketball team, for example. I was watching the great women last night. Um, highly motivated, you're well rested, you're highly motivated. The first thing that happens when you're fatigued, you get to late in the afternoon. This happens to me every day, and I'm like, I'm, I'm just done, I don't care anymore. And I shut the computer off, I'm going home. Um, so the motivation to continue doing something or to do it at its best level is affected by being tired. You all know this. And if you're not highly motivated, then your performance goes down. And if you're doing something that requires a lot of vigilance, and this is an area where the military has been very interested. Navy got involved years ago because you've got people watching radar screens for incoming submarines, airplanes, and so on. And so it's a rare event that happens on your screen. But when it happens, you have to be ready to perform, respond, and check out what it is. But to be able to concentrate and focus on that for hours requires a high level of motivation. So when you're tired, you're more likely to miss things or to miss, miss, uh, make poor decisions about what you're seeing or doing, and then to perform inappropriately. When we're tired, we become increasingly moody and aggressive. Um, anybody who's lived with teenagers, and I'm gonna explain why it's so bad in teenagers, they're the most sleep deprived of anybody in the population. This is why teenagers are moody and more likely to be aggressive. It's really, it's a very, and we all do it. Why is five o'clock the worst time of day at everybody's household or six o'clock? Everybody gets home tired, hungry, moody, <laughs> and aggressive. <laughs> and so avoiding, figuring out how you can manage your life and your family's life to decrease that is a good thing. And finally, one of the things that happens when people are sufficiently fatigued is they begin to have micro sleeps. That is, your brain basically goes to sleep for a few seconds. You often don't even know it's happened. But when it happens and you're driving a large motor vehicle like a car, bad things happen, right? It can also happen, you know, <laughs> My husband will tell you that at 10 o'clock at night, I start going into lo longer than micro sleeps, especially if I'm in a movie. I'm just gone, you know. Did you hear the end of the movie? Of course I did, of course I did. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> right, so we, those kinds of things happen. There are a variety of physiological effects that have a longer term effect on us. If you're chronically, having, being sleep deprived for one or two days, your body will recover from. You recover from quite quickly. But if you're chronically getting, and I'm just gonna lay it out there, less than seven hours of sleep a night, then you're likely to start to see some of these effects. The study that I'm quoting is, I forgot the data is not there, it's from Eve Van Cowder, um, and there have been a series of them now showing that people who chronically get six hours of sleep a night, that doesn't seem like that bad, right? Lots of people are chronically getting only six hours of sleep at night. These are some of the side effects. Your cortisol levels go up. These are the hormones that are a response to stress, the adrenal cortisol levels. There's a heightened sympathovagal and, well, let's go back. Oops, uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. There we go. Sympathovagal tone, which has to do with your heart rate. So your blood pressure goes up, right? So <coughs> stress, home runs are up, heart rate and, and blood pressure is up. The hormone leptin, which tells your brain how much fat you have in your body, so that you eat more or less, depending on whether it's high or low, um, goes down, so your brain thinks you don't have enough fat in your body. Uh -huh. And the hormone ghrelin, which tells you that you're hungry, goes up. So, be t yes, exactly. So why do people who are sleep deprived eat junk? They're too tired and moody to bother to cook healthy food. And their body's telling them that they don't have enough calories in their body. And so people who are chronically sleep deprived are more hungry, they eat more often, and they tend not to eat healthy food. Now, I remember being a college student and you know, writing papers until two or three in the morning. I, I was never good for all-nighters. I'm too much of a morning person. 
Um, and and the, my friends and I eating packages of Oreos, you know, people ordering pizza, sound familiar, Susan? I mean, this is sort of the normal, carbs, 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 people carb load, and you don't need it. I mean, I, you're actually not doing anything to burn calories, but your brain is telling you you need them. So the result is people gain weight. Um, we now know that sleep deprived people frequently find them, will fi you'll find that they're in a pre-diabetic state, pre-type type 2 diabetes state. Um, their sugar levels are high and they're showing those kinds of symptoms. So even without the weight gain, you can get the, those kinds of changes. So it's, it causes a serious physiological alteration that makes a person look like they're um, younger, I mean older than they really are. And finally, um, if you're, all these other things are going on, frequently a second side effect is that people exercise less. They feel like they don't have time, they don't feel good, they're too tired, um, and with the weight gain and some of the other things going on, they just don't feel well. So that feeds back, right? So again, when I teach my freshmen, I like to tell them, you know, sleep will, you, you don't want that freshman 15, get a good night's sleep every night. It'll help. Um, okay, accidents related to this, this problem of not getting enough sleep. Most accidents happen between midnight and 6 a.m., particularly for people under the age of 25. Um, and the reason that's not true for older people is that we're not awake uh, between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, unless you're forced to be because of your job. You know, truck drivers and uh, nurses and doctors, people who work night shifts, firemen. Um, and in the middle afternoon, so for those of you who are just giggling, uh, people over 60, it, this is a nap time. And actually humans are designed to take naps. We really are supposed to have an afternoon nap. And I'll talk about naps again, but a nap is a short sleep bout. 15 to 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, not an hour and a half or two hours. That's a sleep, that's a full sleep, <laughs> short naps. And we're designed for that. And if you miss that, and um, as we get older, we, our sleep tends to be less consolidated and less efficient at night, and then for naps become important again. But I will tell you, the group that sleeps has the most naps, college students. College students take more naps. And I think it's because their schedules are sufficiently flexible that they can fit them in. Person who has an accident is more likely to be alone in the car when it happens and not to remember what happened uh, because they fell asleep at the wheel. And they're more likely to be male. The reason they're more likely to be male is because our culture assigns men the role of being the last person up, right? You drop off everybody else and then you're the person in the car driving home alone. We also take advantage of the fact, I will show you in a minute, that men are more phase delayed when they're young than women are, um, and so they are more likely to work night shifts, to have jobs where they work late night shifts. So they're more likely to be in a car by themselves for a couple of reasons, which are, is really culturally determined. Um, the most common accent, the car drifts off the road and hits a stationary object. There's no other car involved, although that can happen. There are rear end and head on collisions, Again, nobody's trying to break. The person is asleep at the wheel, and they don't know it. Um, okay, and very often they involve serious injuries or fatalities. Today, 50% of all car <coughs> fatalities appear to involve someone who has fallen asleep at the wheel. Right? We don't drink and drive anymore, or much, much less than they did 20 years ago. This is what's killing people, lack of sleep. How big is the problem? Um, an NSF Sleep in America poll found that 62% of people reported having driven drowsy in, in the past year. How many of you found yourself feeling sleepy while driving? Almost all of us. I mean, it happens. Even at four in the afternoon, it can happen. 27% re remember that they actually, they found themselves waking up having dozed off. That business where you jerk awake and you're like, oh my God, you know, don't fall asleep. Roll the window down, turn the radio up. 23% some, know someone who has fallen asleep and crashed. I know someone who died because of it. It's, it's just not that uncommon. Um, I will tell you that one of the things that you can do is drink coffee. Coffee actually helps block the receptors that make you feel sleepy. It's temporary, it's not perfect, but it does help. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna mention that uh, when we are sufficiently fatigued, our reaction times and our performance as a driver looks as, after only 18 hours of being awake. It's not that big a deal. How many, I mean, many days the person could be awake 18 hours. You're, you behave as if you had a 0.05% blood alcohol level. That's legal, but it's diminished, right? So you're a little diminished already. 
Um, you add, if you go 24 hours without sleep, students, this is what an all-nighter will do to you, you, your behavior looks like someone who is impaired. If the police could figure out, and they would like to, a way to measure how sleep deprived a person is, they would make it illegal. They would start to set these exact kind of standards. Uh, Massachusetts is the one state I know that has been really working hard at trying to figure out how to do that uh, because of the accidents. And on four hours of sleep, plus one beer, you have the impact on your function of having had a six pack. So all of these, all of this is, it's fine. It's fine to be overtired as an occasional night. It's okay to have that beer. It's just not okay to drive. So it, it come back to, you know, you have to have a little thought about what your physiological condition is when you're fatigued and what makes sense to do on Friday night when you've been up all week studying for exams or what your job or whatever. So what are the warning signs? You have trouble focusing, um, you're keeping your eyes open or your head up, uh, daydreaming, wandering, disconnected thoughts. This is whether you're driving or not, yawning and rubbing your eyes repeatedly, uh, dif drifting if you're in a car from, uh, it, from your lane, tailgating, missing signs and exits. I still remember when I was you know, probably 22 or 23 in my first job and I had about a half an hour drive to my job on the freeway occasionally getting there and not really remembering how I got there. I'm not, it's just like, oh wow, there's my exit, it's time to get off the road. And you're sort of in this autopilot, and I, at the time it scared me. I was like, how can I be in such an autopilot state that I could get to work and not know I was, at, you know, you just do the whole thing on auto. It means you're not paying attention to what's going on around you very carefully. And people often feel moody and irritable, <laughs> yelling at their children in the back seat. Okay, so what exactly is sleep? We recognize it when we see it. We know what sleep looks like when, when an organism is in that state. Um, and it's often kind of cute and wonderful. Um, but sleep is not just the absence of doing anything or the absence of wakefulness. Sleep is an active, complex, highly regulated function that involves use of your brain in ways that it's not used at, when you're awake. And as we already mentioned, I already mentioned, it's essential to life. Um, this is gonna be my brief primer on sleep. Sleep has stages, most of you probably already know that. Uh, we start off awake with what's considered a low frequency, or I'm sorry, a high frequency, low amplitude. So the brain waves, lots of activity in the brain. And when you use electroencephalogram to measure it, this is basically what it looks like. Very, very fast, and coming from a variety of areas of the brain. And as you go through stage one, <coughs> two, three, the, the waves get bigger, the amplitude grows, and the frequency gets longer between waves. So you start to go get waves like this, right, instead of this, right? And when you get into deep sleep, stage three and four deep sleep, you can see these are very large and very regular, and the waves literally ramp back across the top of the brain. So we alternate between going through these stages into deep sleep and coming back up out of them, generally on a 90 to 110 minute, and it's individual, each of us has our own duration, and going into ra rapid eye movement or dream stage sleep. The beginning of the night, the, dream, the deep sleep phase is generally long, and the dream state is short, and as the night goes on, the uh, depth of the sleep becomes less and the length of the dream phase out of each 90 to 110 minute cycle gets longer. And this is just showing that when you're in um, this stage here, they're going, the rapid eye movements, and so when they do, when they measure, if you go into a sleep clinic, you'll have EEG, you'll have probes put on your head, attached to your head to measure your <coughs> waves, they'll put things here to measure your eye movements. They'll also, often also measure your body temperature because your body temperature is low during these stages and then it goes up during REM and then it comes back down and it goes back up. Not as much as it does from before you go to bed until you wake up in the morning, but within, the, within that area. And the brain is, temperature is going up and down as well. So we can measure all those and, and your breathing. So depending on the clinic and what they're trying to find out about you, um, these are the kinds of measurements. So this is what sleep is. Sleep is the brain changing its function. And in the process, regulating what happens to your body. So if everything works right, while you're in dream sleep, uh, all of your muscle movements from here down except for breathing <laughs> are shut off. You're in a catatonic state. So sometimes you'll wake up and feel like you can't move if you're waking up out of, your, out of a dream, and you really aren't, you know. 
Um, that's why people who have narcolepsy, they go straight into a dream state. They fall to the floor because they're, they're unable to hold themselves upright, um, move their muscles. Um, when you're in the deep stages of sleep, so when you see your dog doing this in his sleep, he's actually in deep sleep. He's not dreaming. We all think he's dreaming, but he's not dreaming. Um, he's just making noises and twitching because he can. So we can study all those kinds of things and understand people use that to define what sleep is. And for people who have sleep disorders, these are the things that they're going to look at. Uh, folks who have apnea, sleep, they wake up very often often don't remember how often they're awake, but you can measure it and see it with these tests. Okay, so how do we regulate the timing of sleep and the amount of sleep? So as the day, this is a, has a lot of pieces to it. Um, first of all, as the day goes on and you're awake, the biochemical byproducts of being awake uh, in, in chemical actions in your brain, there's lots of them, are building up. And, so, and as they build up, you perceive that as getting sleepy. So there's a homeostatic, just as number of hours you're awake, you're just building up, building up at a regular rate. So why don't we fall asleep more often during the day? Uh, and the answer is because we have a circadian mechanism in humans, which is designed to keep us awake. So as the buildup in the need to sleep occurs, there is a corresponding increase in circadian pressure to prevent you from doing that. Now, if you aren't getting enough sleep at night, this is going to start off already higher and build more quickly, and, eventually, and your circadian pushback from your light-dark cycle may not be sufficient to keep you awake. You'll notice that there, this is your actual alertness, right, or awakeness uh, is here, and then at night it goes down. And there's a dip here, and that dip is a time when you are building up the need to sleep, and the circadian system hasn't kicked in very strongly yet, and this is when people usually nap. So lots of folks think that a nap is driven by the fact that you ate lunch. And it's not about eating. It's about being in this place. Because what happens is even if you don't nap, in another hour or so, you feel like you don't really need it because you've moved on in terms of your biology. So when I talk about bedtime and wake time, this is what we're doing. We're controlling this circadian piece of things. So at, as you get, this builds and this gets to this point where you have a normal, your typical bedtime, usually it's gotten dark, the circadian system basically has a rapid shutoff. It just throws a switch and says, we're done keeping you awake. And if you have a regular habit of going to bed at the same time, give or take a half an hour, and getting up at the same time, give or take a half an hour, um, you, will have what's called, you will have a strong gating mechanism. You will get really sleepy. I'm a morning person. My really sleepy hits at about 9.30. I can barely drag myself upstairs to get ready for bed. If I stay awake past that, and I do sometimes, I'll go to a movie, go to a show or whatever, it passes. You pass that gate and you feel awake again. And you can take advantage of that, but it also means that the next day you won't have had enough sleep. So if you have trouble getting to sleep at night, one of the things that the sleep doctors will tell you is strengthen your gating mechanism. You need to go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. You, know, you can have a little, a little window, half an hour or so, and, and build up the strength of that mechanism. And the other thing that happens then is when you shut off the lights and you're in the dark is the hormone melatonin, which is produced by the pineal in your, in your head, um, comes kicking in. And in diurnal mammals like ourselves, animals who are awake during the day and sleep at night, melatonin, one of its functions is to help make you go to sleep. It helps get you to sleep and it helps consolidate our sleep. It helps humans sleep for that eight hours or seven hours or 10 hours, whatever it is that you need, because the mel melatonin has that effect on the sleep, the sleep control centers. So, but melatonin doesn't work if you've got the lights on. Melatonin is suppressed that fast. Literally in 10 seconds, it crashes to zero. So if you're a person who does wake up during the night, don't turn on the lights. I have little red you know, dim, red, little lights all through our house. My children just grew up with this and other people thought we were crazy. Um, but it keeps your brain from knowing that you're, it's not that it doesn't know you're awake, but it doesn't see white light, which, or blue light, which will shut down the melatonin uh, pattern. So, three pieces. You get a buildup of the need to sleep, monotonically with how long you're awake, you have the circadian axis, which is helping stop you from sleeping until the right time. And because humans are long sleepers, that's uh, how we stay awake. 
And then as that gate opens for sleep, melatonin will rise usually about 30 minutes after you go to bed and it'll stay up. What happens in the morning <laughs> is that as you sleep, the chemicals are washed out of your brain, so the sleepiness goes away, um, the melatonin falls, and the circadian system begins to kick back on. It's not kicking on for the purposes of telling you to wake up, it's kicking on for the purpose of getting your bloody temperature to start rising, to get the various hormones that come on, like cortisol comes up first thing in the morning, everything, getting your metabolism up, getting you ready to go for the day. And that's why we wake up, right? So when you have not had enough sleep and you're able to sleep in in the morning, you're actually fighting this, right? And so, it, it, again, it's okay to not get enough sleep on occasion for a day or two. Taking a nap can help because that actually resets this a bit um, and keeps you from oversleeping, needing to oversleep during the night. Okay. I'm not going to stop and ask questions. I'm going to let you ask questions at the end because this is all related to then how you deal with things. So here's a typical adult pattern of sleep. And I have both men and women for all of these data because men and women, as soon as puberty happens, are, are different. Um, and so the sleep latency, when I have a little star, it means there's a difference. Uh, men go to sleep quicker than women do on average. Um, this is probably related to the fact that men are generally more sleep deprived than women. The sleep latency is, is typical. Um, the time to go to bed is not different. The time to awaken, men wake up a little earlier. This could be really, I don't know why they do that, but they do. Their total sleep time is a little bit shorter, although it's not significant. But the, rate, the regularity with which men nap is much higher than it is for women. Now, if you look at that, if you think, if you think of a short nap, a half an hour nap, um, during the day as a way to boost your, the amount of sleep you get during the day, which it is, then in the end, there's really no difference between men and women. It's really about how we distribute the sleep, okay? And so an occasional nap is, a, is not a bad thing at all. Sleep changes across the lifespan. So everybody who's ever been around a baby will recognize <coughs> this. They're awake, then they're asleep, they're awake, they're asleep, right? And they'll sleep, uh, babies can sleep up to 18 hours a day, newborns. I've never had one of those, I wish I'd had, <laughs> but, 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 but I'm told that that can happen. Um, and, but by the time, and be, at this age, they're not circadian, this is why all parents are sleep deprived because the babies are waking up around the clock and needing to be fed. It's about metabolism, it's about energy. They're growing at the fastest rate they'll ever grow at birth. And so, and they're not very big, so they can't hold a lot of fuel in their stomachs, and they don't have much body fat yet, and so they need to wake up frequently and eat. Um, and then as they go, you know, th between three and six months, the circadian rhythm kicks in, they're bigger, they s begin to sleep through the night pretty well, and by the time they're a year old, usually before that, uh, they're having a long sleep at night, usually eight or more, at eight, eight hours or so, and then two naps a day, often one in the morning and one in the afternoon. By four years old, um, they're having a longer sleep at night and an afternoon nap. And by the time, honestly, by the time they're six, the naps are gone. And this is a typical 10-year-old. It's not unusual for, a, for an elementary school child, say from ages five to 11 or 12 when puberty starts, to sleep 11 or 12 hours a night, to sleep quite soundly, and to be raring to go all day long. They are, when you do a multiple sleep latency test, that what the clinicians do to find out how sleep deprived you are, unless a child has a problem and they can have child sleep apnea or they have allergies or something like that, they, they never go to sleep. You put them in a dark room in a bed and you leave them there for 20 minutes. You do that to any of you and I promise you in five minutes you will be out, Phew. cold. 10 year old is sitting there going, can I get out yet? <laughs> can I get out yet, right? Because they're really well rested. And they're happy. They're happy kids, <laughs> most of them. All right. A typical adult between 25 and 55, uh, the a average amount of sleep is about eight hours. That is true. It ranges from seven to nine. Some people need more sleep. Some people need less. If people tell you they need less than seven, I always doubt them because usually what's happening is they're falling asleep during the day and making up some of that sleep. Um, there are people who are genetically able to get by with much less sleep. It is a tiny like 1% of the population, and they sleep like two hours a day their whole lives. I mean, they just are not, and I don't know how they do it. People are trying to figure out how they do it, but that's not typical. You'll notice that there's nothing between 10 and adults here, and that's because this is a stage of life when everything starts changing dramatically. 
going from this to this involves a lot of changes. Um, and one of those problems that happens is that at that age, we also go uh, from what we expect children to be doing in terms of their relationship between sleep and school, where pre-adolescents are able to get 10 hours of sleep at night. They go into bed here, they get up over here, and school starts here. And in lots of communities, Knoxville, I'm happy to say, has made changes. Um, when you get to be an adolescent, uh, it's hard to go to sleep. I'm going to show you some data about that. Um, and then they have to get up earlier to go to school. And the result is, literally between the spring of one year and the fall of the next, they go from 10 hours of sleep a night to seven and a half. And this generally happens uh, between, in, in late middle school. So at the onset of puberty, and I, that's what my research, one of my research projects for many years was about how puberty drives this. And it's true in animals and it's true in us. Um, we can't do this in humans, but in animals, I can tell you, if you don't go through puberty, this is never a problem. Uh, but it, it is in humans. All right, so what happens? Adolescents and young adults phase delay their sleep compared to the rest of the population. And the delay is, you can see that the delay is greater on holidays and weekends and it causes deprivation. So the way this graph is laid out, uh, it, this is bedtime, 2100 hours, nine o'clock. And this is wake up at 8, 0800. Um, the dark bars are during the weekdays, the gray bars are during the weekend. And this is children at two, two to three, three to four. And you can see that the amount of sleep they need gets a little less, but the difference between the weekdays and the weekends is very little until we get out to about here. And now we're 10 to 11, 11 to 12. And I show you this because what I want you to focus on is during the week when you have to get up to go to school, everybody's getting up when they have to get up. But on the weekend, they're getting later and later in how much they sleep. And they're having a hard time going to sleep. So the problem for adolescents is not, people have this idea for a long day, they just don't wanna go to bed, they stay up watching TV or playing on their computers and blah, blah, blah. No, the problem is they can't go to sleep. We now know that they can't go to sleep. They're having great difficulty going to sleep because the melatonin rhythm and everything else has been phase delayed. And it doesn't just happen in us, it happens in other mammals. So if you can't get to sleep, of course you're gonna sleep in in the morning because you still need your sleep. And in fact, during this age, when puberty starts, they need more sleep than they did just the year before, or two years before when they weren't going through adolescence because they're growing so fast. They're growing a lot, you need more sleep. So just at the time when this starts, um, they switch off into school times where they have to get up earlier in the morning. And I want you to notice that this difference continues all the way out to age 30, right? So it, ma it hits its maximum it hits its maximum at around age 19 to 20. It's a little earlier for women than it is for men. Women go through puberty earlier than do men. You start looking at age 10, the boys are still, their preference is to get up early and go to bed early. The girls were already starting to delay at age 10 because the first changes, hormonal changes happen then. Women have less of an average phase delay than do men. Turns out that was true in my animal models as well. Um, in one animal model, the females don't show any change at all, just the boys and in the other it's both sexes. In humans, so the, the gray bars here represent where men and women are significantly different from each other and their preferred patterns of sleep. This is called their chronotype, whether you prefer to get up earlier or later. We all delay, whether you're a morning type as a child or you're a morning type when you're old, you all, we all delay, and then we all gradually move back. You all know, well, those of you who are grandparents, <laughs> like I am, know that we, we get up earlier than our grandchildren, you who are younger know that your grandparents get up earlier than do you. This is a natural thing that changes. And men and women come back together and become on average not different around the age of 50. This does not seem to have anything to do with changes in hormones. We don't really know why this happens. Um, but I found it really distressing when my husband started being underfoot in the morning when I got up. <laughs> <laughs> but we got over it. All right, pattern, sleep patterns of teens and young adults. So this is a data set that looked at people who are more morning type, even when they're t teenagers, and those who are more evening type, and show that they're significantly different in when they go to bed, when they get up, and their number of hours of sleep. And so being a morning person is, if you happen to be genetically, pro have that propensity, um, you have a little advantage during your teenage years because you're less phase delayed and therefore you're able to get more sleep. Um, 
And I, you know, you notice that if you have boys and girls, the girls tend to do a little better on this than the boys as well. But what happens on the weekends? Well, they still are different, but everybody phase delays. So the, the, the morning types are going to bed later, so are the evening types. They're getting up later. Um, but notice what happens is that they end up getting the same amount of sleep. And so the conclusion of this study is that the amount of sleep that high school aged people need is probably closer to nine to nine and a half hours of sleep a night than to seven or eight. And in fact, when we talk about you know, seven to eight or nine hours of sleep in adults, they're, we're past that growth stage and past all those changes. We also do a lot of other things less. We have less deep sleep, we have less repair going on in our bodies, less growth going on in our bodies. Um, those of you who are college students, uh, you probably are going to find that if you do what I'm going to suggest at the end of this lecture, that you're going to sleep eight to nine hours of sleep a night um, to be healthy, to feel good. Okay, how do we improve our sleep? Fix a bedtime. And I really mean, you know, all, every day. So you've got to figure out what time do you need to get up in the morning and work your way back to figure out what time you need to go to bed. And I, and again, my freshmen, I'm hoping none of the students in here are freshmen. Some, you, weren't, you were freshmen not long ago, but when I ta t teach this class to a freshman, I, I can get them to agree that they need more sleep. They figure that out. It's not hard to figure out that you need more sleep. But to get up at the same time and go to bed at the same time, I'll never forget a student saying to me, well, I've got class at 8 o'clock three days a week, and I have class not until 11, two days a week. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So get up at, in time for the 8 o'clock class five days a week well, what am I going to do between 8 and 11? <laughs> it's like, go to the library, do your laundry, read a book, study. I don't, you know, whatever you would normally be doing. So it, it, it's, a, it's a change of thinking about your life instead of I can sleep in and it feels good to sleep in, but to, to regulate it otherwise. Um, you should avoid napping during the day if you're having trouble sleeping at night, um, unless you're ge generally because of reasons you can't control unable to sleep at night. And I think this is why college students take more naps, um, because their life is flexible enough that they can take advantage of the nap phase. I, I do remember doing that a lot when I was in college. You know, half an hour nap at four in the afternoon save, save, make, wakes you back up, gets your brain working, allows you to study in the evening um, when your body is wanting you to be awake anyway when your phase delayed. But for the rest of us, this is something that you can think about whether you need it or not. Avoid alcohol before bed. It actually disturbs the circadian clock, so it disturbs that cycle. That you could drink earlier. Um, caffeine uh, acts to block adenosine receptors. Those are the res adenosine is the one of the main chemicals that tells you you're sleepy. So if you block the receptors for it, you don't know you're sleepy. And um, and it also makes people jittery. Some people jittery. It takes about four to six hours for the half-life of the caffeine to get out of your system. So one piece of advice for people who have trouble getting to sleep at night is to cut down on their coffee at least four to six hours before they wanna to go to bed. Avoid heavy, spicy, or sugary foods, things sitting in your, because you stop doing, your body shuts down the digestive system. That's part of how you save energy and having that stuff sitting in your stomach when you're going to bed makes it hard to sleep for lots of people. Exercise is really good. It helps, exercise is one of the things, if you do it regularly, uh, that helps uh, trigger deep sleep. It helps trigger the release of growth hormone and prolactin during the night when you're asleep. It's the one that gets released um, and helps your, you have good, efficient sleep. But you don't want to do it right before bed. Um, I had a colleague uh, when I was at my last institution who was a young faculty person with a really, I think she was a night owl anyway, with a really phase delay. And she would go to the gym, because it was open 24 seven, at like two in the morning. And I'm like, you can't, you, you know, because you're raising your body temperature. Your body temperature naturally falls in the last hour or so before you go to sleep. And if you instead are out running and raising your body temperature, it's gonna make it hard to go to sleep. Um, so at regular exercise at a regular time is great. Comfortable bedding in a dark, cool room and a quiet space. Right, that helps induce sleep. Uh, we like to tell people that your bed is not your workplace. That's hard when you live in a dorm. Um, but it's better to save your bed for sleeping and activities related to sleeping. Um, the bedroom is not a workroom. All right. Minimizing the impact of electronics. You know, that, you, what I, that list I gave you, you know, they developed that in the 1950s. We knew that that worked to help people sleep. But we didn't have all the screens. 
Uh, <laughs> and the, nat the screens emit blue light. Blue light is the light that tells your brain, tells the eye, is the wavelength of light that's projected to the circadian system and says what time of day it is. And so if at 10 o'clock at night you're staring at blue light, you're telling your brain that it's the middle of the day and you're phase delaying your circadian system. So you want to avoid um, exposure. It's also just a distraction. So put away all electronic devices at least 30 minutes before bedtime or use a blue, low blue light app. There are now apps uh, that you can use on your cell phone and your iPads that will screen out the blue light. I just heard somebody talking, to, they were talking about this on the radio yesterday and actually this was in the Knoxville News two days ago, uh, No Rest for Weary Baby Boomers and it talks about many of these same things. I thought maybe I should just hand this out and not give my lecture. Uh, but the, the one, one, per, one sleep expert said, yeah, he does all this, he gets rid of the lights and he uses red light app and he does all this. And another one said, yeah, but it kind of looks funny. Things are a little red and so I don't like it. And I'm like, you idiot. <laughs> it's just like, uh, it's like, okay, so you don't really have any trouble going to sleep because when you do, you will use anything to try to make it stop happening. Um, turn off sound on devices and remove them from sleep room. I can't tell you how many teenagers in, when my kids were in high school would talk about how their phones were buzzing and worrying and carrying on all night long and it would wake them up. And I have colleagues who are my age who talk about how the iPad sitting next to their bed comes on in the middle of the night and they'll get it take. I'm like, why? Just, you, you unplug them, put them in another room, turn off the sounds. I don't have anything in my room that makes noises that will wake me up. You just don't need, I mean, what, unless you work in student life, which I've discovered, they ha they're on call 24-7. And so those people are the most sleep deprived people I've ever met. It was unbelievable. Um, but if you don't have a reason why you have to hear your phone ring or respond to some, t you just don't need to know it till the next morning. It'll be there tomorrow. Life, life will, you can unplug. You should unplug at night. Um, and if you have children, getting them to unplug is really helpful. You know, a lot of families now, you know, okay, everybody, we've collected up all your devices, you know, 40 minutes before bedtime, everything goes in a box and it goes out into the kitchen away. Um, if you have onset insomnia, this is the hardest one, honestly, to deal with. Um, do things that will take your mind out of its anxiety racing mode. This is where getting, turning off your computer, I have lots of friends who say they won't answer any email after eight o'clock because it keeps them awake. Um, anything that will disturb you, get, get rid of it. Read, calm things, listen to music, be in a dimly lit room, do things like meditation or focused breathing exercises, things that will take you out of your normal sort of racing brain mode, um, can, it can help. Um, awakening during the night. This is uh, also very common, especially as we get older. Uh, minimizing light exposure helps go back to sleep. Um, if you're one of those people who wakes up, and I am, and you're, you're worrying about the next day, um, keep a pad of paper and a pen next to your bed in the dark, write it down, and then it's done. You don't have to keep racing, your head doesn't have to keep going over and over it for fear of losing it, it's there. You're studying for a test, oh my God, did I remember to study about X? Write that down, and then when you wake up in the morning, you're, you'll look at that and go, well, that was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll have the reminder you need and you'll go look at what you need to look at. But it helps you, for lots of us, it helps us go back to sleep. Um, okay, so just to remind you, being exposed to red or orange light is good during the night. It has no effect on your circadian system. It doesn't cause you to reset your clock. And blue-green light is bad during the night because it tells you that it's a different time of day. No, so if you turn on your lights at midnight, well, let's pick a different time, at one in the morning and you went to bed at 10, it's as if you went to California and got it, you know, or on the, that, that you're doing a phase shift. All right, so my take home message is, if you've got kids, let them sleep. They really, really need it. Um, if you are an adult who's not getting enough sleep, you need to get it. So I love this, let him sleep. What, the poor kid was up past midnight studying but, but the school's expecting to be in class all day doing homework. This is foot talking. And um, studies show that teenagers need, need 10 to 12 hours of sleep every night to be healthy. Well then, cut him some slack. The world won't end if he misses a class one day. And the boy wakes up, oh my gosh, I'm late. I know you were exhausted. So you let me sleep? Yes, I'm giving you permission to sleep. <laughs> and I actually have permission scripts. <laughs> <laughs>
prescriptions. I, I, uh, I give these out to my freshmen when they're headed home for vacation because it's incredible how often parents insist that their college student needs to get up at 8 in the morning because they're up at 8 in the morning when they have no idea how sleep deprived they are from final exams. And I'm like, kids, take this home, tell your parents that the, the professor says you need to sleep. <laughs> Catch up, get, back, get yourself on schedule. What this is actually for is to give you uh, a method for figuring out what your sleep duration needs to be. And so going to bed for at the same time, give or take a few, you know, 20 minutes or so, um, for at least a week and then wake up on your own. So you could do this during vacation. And what usually happens is that people will sleep, young people especially, will sleep 12 or 14 hours. But then as the days go on, they'll sleep fewer. And then it, they'll settle in at, you know, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, nine hours of sleep. Uh, the older we are, the less it is. Usually it'll be eight or, you know, it's between seven and eight. And once you know that, then you need to wrap your head around fixing your life so that you could get that much on a regular basis. All right. White noise is fine. Yeah, it just helps keep all the other distractions out. I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. Yeah. Mel to take which kind of things? Medicine to sleep. Medicine to sleep. <laughs> the answer is it's not very good, actually. Um, there are very few products, and most of them are not available, um, that allow you to have normal sleep. So that pattern I sleep I was talking about where you go through stages up and down, that doesn't happen on most <coughs> sleep medications. The one thing that can be helpful for some people is melatonin. You can actually take... Um, from, get from health food stores or actually in any store nowadays, melatonin. Three to five milligrams. You don't need more. Than, it's either going to work or it isn't going to work. So it'll work at three to five milligrams. Taking more won't make it any better. Um, it tends to be more helpful for people as we get older because lots of times the pineal calcifies and so we're producing much less melatonin. But even for some young people, it do, the melatonin isn't rising the way it should. So if you take melatonin about a half an hour before you go to bed at night, um, it'll either, and for some people, it will help them go to sleep and help consolidate sleep. If you take it and you don't see any difference, then stop taking it. It's just a waste of money. Um, but it might help. It helps some people. It's also helpful when you fly somewhere and you're jet lagged. You can start taking it at your new bedtime and at the bedtime there, and it can help speed up recovery. But most of the, you know, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Ambien, for example, people don't have normal sleep. Um, if you don't stay asleep, if you take it and you're not actually in bed for about eight hours, and for women more, um, you get up and you're walking around with your eyes open, but your brain is still half asleep, and people have, you know, bad things happen. And it took them a while to realize that women turned out, so we don't metabolize it as well as men do. So they give women now half the dose they give men. But for a number of years, they were giving everybody the same dose, and it was bad, bad news. But when you stop taking most of those drugs and you have what we call rebound, your brain starts dreaming. You have these wild, crazy dreams and all kinds of stuff like that. Now, is it better to take a sleep medication than to take nothing when you're under a lot of stress? You know, somebody has, you know, terrible things happen. You've had surgery and you're not sleeping. You have a lot of pain. Um, there's been a death in your family. You know, those kinds of situations where you take sleep medication for a, a few days or a couple of weeks, that, that, that's acceptable. But long-term sleep medication is actually not, you don't get good sleep. Yeah. Uh, over the past couple of years, since I came to college, I've noticed my eyesight getting worse. And I know you've talked about that, but is that maybe just because I'm aging or do you think it's linked to the room sleep? Um, so it's more likely that your eyesight is getting <laughs> worse because you read a lot. So there's a relationship between, the, why do we get nearsighted? There's a combination of uh, genetics and how much do you do close work. Um, and so if you're having trouble seeing, you should go to an eye doctor, you probably need glasses. <laughs> and I mean, sleep doesn't, it's not so much that it makes it hard for you to see, it's more like what, how your brain is deciding what it's seeing, that's the problem. So you shouldn't be having trouble, for example, focusing um, 
you probably, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you probably need glasses yeah. <laughs> or, or some kind of corrective lens. It happens a lot to people as they get to be. I mean, usually it happens when we're young for those of us who are, uh, you know, I was like, I don't know, eight or nine when I had to start wearing glasses, but there's a whole nother round of that that happens when people get to college age. Yeah, around four, yeah, but he's nowhere near that yet. <laughs> yes. Um, so here, here's what we, so if you were a, the fact that, so you've worked a graveyard shift and you're here right now, that's a problem. <laughs> so you get off work, you know, I don't know what your schedule is. My daughter is a nurse and she used to work the three to three shift. She'd get off at three in the morning, go home, go into a darkened room and, and she would do eight hours of sleep. But even doing that, she still, if she had problems and people have problems. There's a lot of data on nurses um, that show there's an increased uh, problems with fertility, um, you know, menstrual cycle irregularities, increased rate of cancer, um, all for people who work long hours. So your immune system becomes disrupted. That actually makes some sense because one part of what happens is, remember that melatonin thing that goes up at night? Right. It only does that during the night in the dark. So if you're a nurse working on the floor and the lights are on, you're suppressing your melatonin and of course you're awake. When you go home and you go to bed at eight in the morning or three in the morning or whatever time, you actually don't get the normal rise. And melatonin, its other function, its main function is immune system function. So they think that now that what's going on is, and the other thing that happens with people who work night shifts, even if they're getting eight hours of sleep a, night, or a day, um, is they're more prone to get viral infections and other kinds of infections. So it's clear that the immune system is disrupted by that. Um, if you're young and you're already very phase delayed, you know, so it's easier uh, as you get older. So there's some wonderful data on people that work night shifts um, in factory settings who in their, in their young years, in their 30s, uh, their rhythms were still normal. They felt fine. You know, they, everything seemed to work fine. And then when they got to their 50s, they were a mess. Their internal body rhythms were free running. They couldn't lock on anymore. They were having all kinds of cognitive symptoms and physiological symptoms. So humans are meant to be asleep between, <laughs> at, particularly between two and five in the morning. You know, the worst things happen in those hours. The worst car accidents, the worst truck accidents, ships run aground, you know, fire trucks crash into things. People aren't really supposed to be out. Now we have people that have to, you know, we run a 20, people, fires happen in the middle of the night, Emergencies happen in the middle of the night. Hospitals have to be open. Uh, but you know, if you don't have to have a job working at night, you're better off. And if you are, then you really need to think really carefully about how do you um, stay on a schedule so that your body isn't flipping out of five days in a row of night shifts and then on to. Nurses have gone to this cycle where they do two days, two 12s, and then they're off. So they really stay on day schedules and they basically are doing an all-nighter. You know, every every couple, and they found and they found that they're healthier that way than when they're all on those eight hour, eight night hour nights, and and then are going during the day to go shopping in the light and not getting enough sleep. Yeah, I like this. Well, years ago, I had an officer uh, that said that before uh, the industrial revolution and before the uh, development of electricity, that people actually, especially in winter when there's long nights, that their sleep pattern was different. It is. The that's true. That that's right. Um, so you're, you're absolutely correct that there, there's data on that. Um, Thomas Jefferson kept great detailed notes about that. Uh, they didn't tend to get up because getting up in the middle of the night in the middle of the winter, right, they banked their, the fire. I mean, it was, it's cold. Um, but he would sit up in bed and write. He had this whole setting so that he could bring, pull over a candle, which doesn't disrupt your circadian clock. And, and you know, he would write in the middle of the night. So people often, people who are, compo people talk about composing poetry in, you know, in, their, in, the, in that stage at night and music and talking to one another, making babies, you know, that's when they would do those things, right? And then people go back to sleep again. So this is in a world where basically the sun goes down, people eat a meal and they go to bed because 
they don't, you know, it's costly to heat your house when you have to have firewood um, or coal or whatever. And then they get up when the sun comes up. Uh, and is it healthier? It is what it is. I mean, it's clear that we can be quite healthy if we can get eight hours of sleep a day. I will tell you that when you sleep, when you live like that, you don't get tired during the day. Nobody takes naps. You said early in your talk that American society was chronically uh, sleep, sleep deprived. deprived. Are there any societies that do get enough sleep and do they perform better? So hunter-gatherer societies get enough sleep. Uh -huh. Seriously, they've, they've <coughs> gone out and measured them. Um, and cultures, so even just when we were young in our, in our youth, uh, cultures that still had, had, did siestas, so Spanish and South American cultures, get more sleep in a day they used to. Now, as they become more westernized in their, you know, people go further away from home to work, um, they get less sleep. China, I remember when I was a young professor having somebody talk about Chinese people would go home for lunch and they would take a nap. And so, <clears throat> and you know, we, we go and make a trip there and this uh, colleague was telling about how the end of their time was coming and they decided they would work through lunch. And she has a photograph of every person in the room with their head on the table asleep. <laughs> out. <laughs> so, you know, that was their, and even though they wanted to finish hearing the final conversation and lectures, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't hold it together. Um, so I don't, you know, is it healthier or not? I, I think what the, the, as long as you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep as an adult and you do it at a regular, on a regular schedule, you're healthy. It doesn't all have to be at night, but just remember a nap is a short thing. Mm -hmm. It's a short thing. It's not an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. Uh, you have a free running thing? Less time on devices. I will have to stay up to one hour later and, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then. And do you have the lights on while you're up? Um, that extra hour? Well, yeah, it's just not a good idea to stay in until you're not asleep. But you don't have to have the lights on when you're up. So or you, if you have white light on. So here's the thing you may be particularly sensitive to this, the phase setting effects of light. And so by having the light on an extra hour every day, you're, you're resetting yourself later and later because you're doing it at the, in the night. Right. And so the, some people are very sensitive to that and have to be really careful. And what I usually tell people is if the things we talk about here don't work, really tr go see a sleep doctor. I mean, they exist. We have them here. They, they're over at the UT hospital. They do a great job with people. They'll monitor you, give you you know, real individualized help with thinking about how to uh, deal with your particular situation. I mean, people who are on ADD medication have a terrible time dealing with sleep because it, it increases arousal. Um, there's all kinds of situations people can be in, including just the natural gen genetic variation that we have in the human population uh, that can affect our ability to sleep. And Amanda's going, gotta yes. go, gotta go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.